<laughs> All right. Bad news is the mic's broke. Good news is I used to do open air preaching. So if y'all can hear me, give me a thumbs up and I'll <coughs> try to crank my voice up for you. I appreciate that testimony, Mihaela. Um, what she's talking about is we meet once a week, uh, at least once a week, we meet in things called Great Commission Groups where different members of the church, families get together and we invite people in to see what life looks like with Christ. And it can be difficult, it can be messy. Uh, what she didn't tell you was that um, the, lady, the lady wanted to come cook for us, which was a blessing. But she was supposed to come at 4 o'clock and we we're going to have dinner at 6.30. She showed up at 6.30 due to some unforeseen circumstances. And we didn't start eating until 9, and she didn't leave until like 10.30. And so those of y'all that have kids in school, you know that that's kind of late. Um, so the cool thing about that was is the whole group was flexible. Uh, we had dinner with this lady. We got to share with her that what Mihaela just said about she's forgiven, uh, and, and Christ works and not her own. So at Convergence Church, we're going through the book of Romans right now. So today's passage is going to be from Romans 1 verses 8 through 17. And if you don't have a Bible and you'd like a Bible, we have some some Bibles that are available to you. Too many of Bible? Very good. Alright, so the title of today's sermon is The Rhythm of a Heart That Beats for God. Have you guys ever heard a train on a train track? The sound it makes as it goes, the pitter-patter, the pitter-patter. There's a pattern. What about the flow of music we just sang? You can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a there's a, a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus, and then a crescendo. Bridge. In our church service, we have a pattern. We, we read scripture. We sing songs. We have announcements. We do the Lord's Supper. We hear from God's Word. We do a benediction. Have you ever thought about your daily routine, how you wake up, you brush your teeth, you take a shower, you shave, you put on clothes, you go to work, or you stay home if you're a mom, you get the kids ready for school, you go to work, you work hard, you eat lunch, you eat breakfast, you, you come home, you eat dinner, you spend a couple hours recreating, and then you go to bed. There's a pattern of life. This pattern of life is called a rhythm. A rhythm is defined as a strong, regular, repeated pattern of movement or sound. Our life rhythms are defined by the most important organ in our body, which is the heart. heart. The heart. But the Bible doesn't just simply describe the heart as an organ, or as most of us like to think of the heart as a Valentine's Day symbol. The Bible says that the heart is what controls you. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart <clears throat> excuse me, with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. From your heart flow the springs of life. Whatever kind of heart you have, determine what your heart beats for. Everyone's life follows a certain pattern or rhythm. Our heart controls what we do. Remember this though, we are not defined by what we do. We are defined by who we are. Who we are determines what we do. In today's text and sermon, we will get an up-close look at the rhythm of a heart that beats for God. If y'all would stand with me, we'll read Romans 1, verse 8 through 17. The Apostle Paul says, in verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I have been prevented. 
in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father, we need your grace. I need your grace to preach. Father, I need uh, your grace to speak what you've spoken and nothing else. Uh, your people, God, need grace to hear and apply the, the inspired word of God to their lives. Father, we pray, Father, if it is your plan that you would save us all here today. We pray, God, that you would strengthen your church through the preaching of your word. Empowered by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. So I want to give you guys some context to this passage. The book of Romans, what many people believe to be one of the greatest theological works in all the canon, the whole Bible. Now Paul is writing a letter to the church of Rome. And the context is, in AD 49, the emperor of Rome, Claudius, he issued an edict for all the Roman Jews. He said they all have to leave. And so this church in Rome grew primarily of Gentile Christians, non-Jewish Christians. And so as Paul is writing the letter in the 57, 58 AD, about 10 years later, the Jews started migrating back to the church of Rome. And what happened was there started to be division. The church, of, the church of Rome, the Gentiles said, hey, we've been doing this thing good on our own. We don't need you guys. And the, the Jewish Romans, uh, Christians, they were saying, hey, we're the true church and this is our church. And so Paul is getting ready to, um, he's getting ready to just rock our world with great theological text. Uh, that converges we're going to go through. Uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're going to try to be faithful to tell you what the, the Bible says and not what we think, but what God says. And so if you remember last week, those of y'all that were here, um, our brother Rick had a great message. It was basically the intro, verses 1 through 7. And Paul's giving his credentials as an apostle and as a gospel man. So as we look at, uh, you guys have on your sheets there, um, Had a sheet somewhere. Um, the first, the first uh, rhythm of a heart that beats for God. Number one, it's it's a heartbeat for God. So if you want to fill in the blanks, I encourage you to do so. For those of us at Convergence Church, we can speak about this to each other throughout the week. But the first bullet point there is a heartbeat for God. So, in in verse eight, the, the word that's used that Paul uses is the word first. Now, it's interesting to note that he doesn't use second, third, fourth, anywhere throughout the letter. But he's saying first. So again, as Paul, as Paul lays out crazy doctrines that are hard for us to stomach, you know, uh, Romans chapter 9 talks about election. Um, Romans 2, 3 talks about that we're all sinful. We all deserve God's wrath. Uh, these are hard pills to swallow. And so before he lays out this doctrine, Paul essentially rips the heart out from his chest and he shows them what it's beating for him. And so before he hits them with doctrine, he shows them that this is his heart. He says, I thank my God. The first, I think it's interesting here is Paul writes to this church that he knew there was lots of problems with. He first thanked God. He knew that God was the source of everything. He knew that it was for God that he was saved. He knew that it was for God that they were saved. And then he says through Jesus Christ, Paul gives props to Christ here, and he does in Colossians 1.16. He says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Everything that God has done was through Jesus Christ. But why is he thankful to God? It says he is thankful for all of you because your faith is proclaimed throughout all the world. Now, we live in a day and time, 2017, where um, if something were to happen here, 
if, uh, if this ceiling were to fall within a couple minutes through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, somebody in South Africa could, could be watching a video of this place falling. So. But back then, social media didn't exist. So how did they hear? It was through people telling people telling people. So earlier, 10 years before that, we knew that this church was getting started. And 10 years later, what, what's happening? Paul's hearing, hey, all this stuff's happened in Rome. This church grown. And guess what? He hadn't even been there yet. So he was thankful for that. And he goes on to say that, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. So Paul was, he had a heart of thankfulness. That's A, by the way. Heart of thankfulness. Paul's heart beat for God. He had a heart of thankfulness. And that last thing there where he says this, he serves God in the Spirit through the Gospel of the Son. Paul counted service to God as a privilege. Not an arduous task. Not a, not a checklist. This was something that he knew he had been saved and set apart, as we saw last week. Paul had been set apart for this mission. He had been set apart for the Great Commission. He had been set apart to share the Gospel, to spread the Gospel, to watch the Kingdom grow. And so because of that, he counted a privilege to serve God. It's the highest calling for a Christian to be about the work of God. And Paul knew it, and that's what he says there. And so Paul had a heart of thankfulness. The second bullet point there is Paul's heartbeat for God's people. We're going to walk through the text here. Uh, in the second part of 9 and 10, it says, that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers. When we think of ministry, um, a lot of times we think of we got to go somewhere and do something, right? So again, was Paul there? No. But was Paul active in ministry? How? Prayer. Paul was consistently praying for this church. They were always on his mind. And so he was active with them in ministry. That's, that's number A, or letter A. He had a heart of prayer. His thankfulness led him to pray for them. Paul, heart beat for God's people. B is the heart of fellowship. A couple verses here, verses 10b through 11a and 13a. It says, Asking that somehow by God's will I may now at least succeed in coming to you, for I long to see you. 13b says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. And we just got done reading as a church, Acts, the book of Acts. And all through Acts, for years and years and years, we see Paul striving, longing to be with this church in Rome. So much so that as he preached a couple weeks ago, he was snake bitten, he was flogged, he was beaten, thrown out of town, he was imprisoned, he was persecuted in major ways. Why? So that he could be with them. So this wasn't just a uh, mere mention, hey, I just want to be with you guys. Uh, we know as the story unfolds in Acts 28, he actually got there and all the things it cost him. So I want you to think of that as Paul longed to have fellowship with them. Why did he have long, long to have fellowship with them? Letter C, heart of service. Paul had a heart of service. In verse 11b, it says that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Paul didn't just want to show up at this place so he could correct them of all their wrong things and point a finger at them. Paul knew that he had something that could bless them. Paul knew that he had a gift that they were lacking. And so it was his desire to come and be an offering to them so that he could serve them. Paul knew and understood this is the way the body worked. He knew that it would bless them and would also bless him, which leads us to letter D. Paul's heartbeat for God's people gave him a heart of encouragement. In verse 12 it says, That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Paul knew that by praying for, longing to be with, serving and blessing them, that in his soul he would himself be blessed and encouraged. It wasn't just about him or even them, but Paul knows the power of edification and encouragement that exists when the entire body of Christ humbles ourselves and pitches in for everyone's benefit. His mention here of mentioning each other's faith and using the words yours and mine signifies, as Douglas Moo says, it puts that they share the same faith but with distinctions. Just like us today. 
We all share in the same faith, but in different ways. But we're all part of the same body. Paul had a big kingdom mindset. This is the heart that beats for God's people. He would later go on to say in the same book, Romans chapter 15, 32, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. He understood the encouragement that happens when we work together in unison. Paul loved God's people, but he also had a huge desire to see many come to be a part of the family of God, which leads us to the third point. Paul had a heartbeat for the lost. Letter A, his heart was for all to be saved. Paul was affectionately known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, pre the gospel coming to the Gentiles, it was just for the Jews. The Jews were, were Jesus' people. He grew up Jewish. He had Jewish disciples. And, and the Jews looked down upon the Gentiles. And the Gentiles kind of looked down on the Jews. They were a different people. And Jesus Christ's gospel came for all people. Verses 13b says, In order that I may reap some harvest as you, excuse me, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. If you guys have pens and you write in your Bibles, I want you to circle verse 13b. In order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as the rest of the Gentiles. I think this verse is mad or super important. Because we can be thankful, we can pray, we can go to encourage, we can equip. But what's it all for? Paul had a desire to see the kingdom grow. This is why Paul was a missionary to the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul wanted to reap the harvest for the people in Rome. Rome was the epicenter of the known universe at the time. It's still, to this day, one of the biggest cities in the world. So what, where, what happens when you've got a big city? What do you have a lot of? People. people. So he wanted to take the gospel of the people. He knew that by getting to Rome, essentially at Rome too, if you, if you know your history, uh, Rome was the center of the universe. It had the roads coming out of it. They had aqueducts in place. Uh, the word was able to, if you could get to Rome, man, that message could get anywhere. Because all roads led out of Rome or pointed into Rome. It flowed in and out. Rome was, Rome was the city. Paul's end goal was the Great Commission. Watching the gospel do work and the kingdom grow. He desired to reap the harvest. He desired for them to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It goes on to say in 14 and 15, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So what he's saying here is uh, Greeks and barbarians... When y'all think barbarian, you probably think Conan. If you're older like me. Um, but what it meant here was the Greeks were kind of the sophisticated people. They were the people that had education. Maybe they were fluent. Uh, they could speak different languages. And the barbarians were kind of the lower class people. They were frowned down, frowned down upon in society. Didn't have good jobs. Um, education wasn't well. They weren't very well spoken. And Paul's saying, listen, this gospel... Is for the rich and for the poor, for the educated and the uneducated. He says to the wise and to the fools. So this is everybody. And this is why he was eager to preach the gospel, because it was for everybody. When we think about uh, rhythms and patterns, um, I'm a hip hop guy myself. But I think most genres have a drum, a hi-hat, a snare. And so for me, the snare is like the, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the thing that gets you moving. If you're a hip-hop guy, you, you bob your head to the snare. And for rock guys, you bang your head to, to the snare. Or you just bang your head like crazy. I think that's what Scott does. That's how he gets that hair. Um, <laughs> true story. So... I think, the, I think the snare drum to the pattern of, of Paul's heart is what we find here in number four. His heart beat for the gospel. His heart beat for the gospel, point number four. Now, these two verses are huge. Um, we could spend hours breaking them down. If you need help understanding the Greek and the Hebrew 
and all the original languages and parsings, y'all talk to Rick. Uh, but I'm going to give you a some plain, quick overview. Um, verse 16, letter A. Heartbeat for the gospel is a heart that is unashamed. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul knew where the power was. Power wasn't in him. It wasn't in you. It wasn't in uh, his good works. It wasn't in his desires, his longings, and his prayers. The power was in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know how Paul knew that power? Because he was rocked by it. When he was on the road to Damascus to kill Christians, what happened? Jesus Christ appeared, the good news came to him, and Paul was converted. He was personally impacted by God's grace. It was God's power that saved him. It was God's power that was keeping him. It was God's power that would finish his life into eternity. So, in essence, the most powerful weapon we have as Christians is the gospel. And Paul wasn't afraid of that. He wasn't afraid to use it. He knew that as much as these churches need a pat on the back, somebody to come feed, give water, encourage, all these things, most importantly, they need the gospel. So if Paul wasn't afraid of his most powerful weapon, we shouldn't be either. Letter B. Paul had a heart of faith. Verse 17 says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. By faith alone and Christ alone we are saved. Paul is quoting Habakkuk 2.4, which reads, The righteous shall live by faith. To the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, he says, by, faith through, excuse me, by grace through faith we are saved, not of work, so that no man can boast. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith. Later in Romans 5, 19, Paul said we are made righteous by faith. And in Galatians 2, 16, he says, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. I just read that twice. So double blessing. There. It is Christ's righteousness that saves us. And the only way to receive that gift is to trust in Him. John 3.36, that um, after John 3.16, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That is how we receive faith, by believing and having faith in what God has done. When you believe on the Lord, as Genesis 15, 6 says, as Paul said to Abraham, he promised him, he said, if believing in the Lord, he counted him as righteous. And it continued on. So going back to Martin Luther, um, his history is, is it's amazing. If you've never seen the, mo the movie Luther, there's a modern day one with, uh, what's the guy's name? Ralph Fiennes. Ralph Fiennes. I don't know if it's DiCaprio. But there's a movie uh, on Luther that's it's, it's actually pretty um, accurate. And if you study Luther's life, uh, before he became a Christian, he was a, he was a monk. I mean, he, was, he had a licentious life, and then he got converted to, to the monastery. And <clears throat> Luther's big thing was he knew he was a sinner. He knew that. And so he would beat himself like a sadomasochist. He'd beat himself. He would try to scrub floors for hours. He was trying to do everything he could to atone for his sin. And one day, just reading the Scriptures, he got to Romans 16 and 17, chapter 1, and, and he read it, By faith you're declared righteous. And it was like the, the bounds, the, the shackles that were surrounding him, that were he was like in a straitjacket, just been let free. Because he finally understood that there was nothing he could do. It was all about what Jesus did. 15... Uh, excuse me, five centuries later, here we are. The same gospel that saved the Apostle Paul. The same gospel that saved Martin Luther. is the same gospel that saves us. So I just want to ask you guys a couple questions in light of what we just talked about. What is the rhythm of your heart? If you're here today and you're listening to this message, I know the kids want to go play, the adults want to eat and all this stuff, but I want you to concentrate on this question. What is the rhythm of your heart? What does your heart beat for? First off, do others know your heart? 
lot of times, us Christians, we know we've got the most powerful weapon, and the first thing we want to do is start shooting that thing all over the place. Right? We want to tell people all our doctrine and, and how they're going to hell unless they trust in Jesus, and, and it's true, but we show them our heart. I think Paul models for us here to show our heart before we show our theology. And our theology should drive us to show our heart. So what does your heart beat for? Does your heart beat like Paul? Do you have a heart of thankfulness? Do you delight in God? Do you see this, this Christian life as a duty or a privilege? It's not something we have to do, Norman. It's something we get to do. We get to do this. This is a privilege. This is not something, this is not a, well, we have to do this. Oh, it's an arduous chore. I don't want to do it. We get to be a part of the family of God, a mission for God, serving God. And that's an amazing thing. Are we thankful for one another? Paul was thankful for a church that was jacked up. Hey, guys, we're jacked up too. So what I want to do is I'm going to take one minute. I want you all to look around. And I want you to tell somebody you're thankful for. Thank you for our first as the church. I'm thankful for you. Wow. <laughs> oh, there it is. Thank you for you guys. I'm thankful for our first All right. Hey, nobody, nobody was thankful to Scott Werner. So let's all tell him. Thank you, Scott. All right. I didn't want to miss out, but I want y'all to know that that as a, a, a person with a thankful heart, we're thankful to God, we're thankful for His gospel that saves us, and we're thankful that we get to be a part of this church, or any church. If you're visiting here, man, be thankful for your home church. Do we pray for others? Do you pray for others? i got to be honest with you, most of the time when I pray, it's for myself, my family, our church. I'm not typically praying for the church down the street or the people down the road, or whatever the case is. Are we praying for others? Paul had a heart that prayed for others. Do you have a heart of fellowship? Do you long to be with the brethren? Do you look forward to this day when we can come together? Yeah. Just said yes. Love that guy. Do you long to be together with this group of jacked up people that you can look at and say, man, that guy's jacked up just like me. Yeah. <laughs> like, we don't have to come in here and put on a mask and pretend that we're some perfect person. The church is like a hospital, right? It's not a, uh, it's not a Hollywood show where everyone's pretending to be perfect. It's a hospital of sinners who are saying, we're broken, we need help, the gospel's our doctor, the Holy Spirit's going to minister to us, and we need each other to help each other. Right? Do you, do you have a heart of service? Um, in 2017, I can tell you that most people have a heart to be served. Do you have a, a heart to serve the church? Do you have a heart to serve your family? Do you have a heart to serve your next door neighbor? Do you have a heart to serve your co-workers? Do you have a heart to serve the homeless guy on the street? Most of us, I mean, if we're being real honest, we don't. And I'll be the first to admit I remember coming home from Time Warner, driving an hour from Valentine. I had to do everything I could to pray those five minutes before I got home to come home and serve my family. Because when I got home after a long, hard day of being an account manager and dealing sales and quotas and stuff, man, last thing I wanted to deal with was kids wilding out and toys all over the floor. And I had to pray hard. I had to pray that God would change my heart. And I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Do we have the heart for encouragement? Most of us love being encouraged. Raise your hand if you don't like to be encouraged. <laughs> My son. <laughs> Most of us like to be encouraged. You know how you know how you get encouraged? How? How do you get encouraged? Other people. So it takes two to tango, right? So if someone's going to be encouraged, there has to be an encourager. My kids yesterday, uh, they helped their uncle move. Man, they couldn't stop talking. When they got home, they were so excited. Like, Dad, it was so awesome. We worked together. We moved stuff. We were helping clean. Like, really? That's exciting? They were serving. And when they helped serve somebody else, Mom, were you encouraged? Yeah. He was encouraged. And guess what? So were they. 
when we step outside our comfort zone and we step in an uncomfortable zone and start serving others, we're, we're mutually blessed. That's what it means to encourage. Do we have that kind of heart? Do we desire for all people to be saved? How often do we limit who God can save? How often do we do we, do we see someone who's, who's wild and they're just so sinful and they just hate God and we're like, man, we may not say, hey, God can't save that person, but our actions... Our actions are speaking what our heart is saying. How often do we see ISIS on the news, blowing up churches, and think those people deserve hell and don't, and don't understand that we deserve the same hell? Those people could be saved. The people in our life who cause us issues could be saved. I'm not going to go in my background because I don't need to, but I was far from God and I was saved. If God can save me and He can save some of the people in this setting, then He can save me. We're really pretty rotten news. Is your heart out of shame? A couple weeks ago, uh, I was with Brother Rick. We were at IHOP. And uh, it's customary. We, we always ask people if we could pray for them before we, you know, before we eat. And our waitress came up and Rick asked her if he could pray for her. And she said, no. Nope. And she walked away. That doesn't usually happen. So what Rick did next, he, he opened his mouth and he, oh Lord, would you please save? So he prayed the gospel. Like we were alone in this place. And I'm in my seat like. <laughs> and I got to admit to you guys, I was ashamed. I was ashamed of the most powerful weapon that God's ever given me. The gospel. Are you guys ashamed? A real practical thing is this. When somebody comes to you with a problem, oh, my life's in turmoil, my wife did this, my kids did that, my job is horrible. You know what the solution is? <laughs> huh? Somebody say it. You know what the solution is? Jesus. They don't need a new job. They don't need a, a better wife. They don't need their kids to be more obedient. That's nice. What they need is Jesus. And so a real practical way you can tell you're unashamed is if someone comes to you with their problems and you give them, hey, good advice, encouragement, I'll be praying for you, brother. Give them the gospel, man. And if you don't give them the gospel, I'm just marking to say that you're probably ashamed. And lastly, do you have a heart of faith? Do you, do you understand that you are justified by Christ's works, not your own? Do you understand that Jesus Christ on the cross, as the wrath of God was poured out on Him, as He took our punishment, He said, it's finished. you believe that? Because if you believe that, guess what? There's no more condemnation. There's no more trying to earn God's favor. There's no more, oh man, I went to bed at night, I didn't do all this stuff. I wake up in the morning, I got all the stuff I got to do. If you're, if you're here today and you think that that's the kind of gospel that God has laid on you, man, I ask you to repent and trust in the true gospel. God has freed you from that. Like that lady the other night, she couldn't understand. She's like, I cannot understand what y'all are saying. Why would God send His Son, who was fully God and fully man, to pay the price for me as a sinner and desire to be in a personal relationship with me? This doesn't make sense. And I said, you're right. This doesn't make sense. That's why we call it grace. Because we deserve the almighty wrath of God. Because we're wicked sinners. And God's perfect. And God can't fellowship with darkness. But God sent His Son, Jesus. So if you're here today and you're a Christian, you're justified. Amen. Ask out that. Your heart is justified. You have a heart of faith. Go be a Christian. Go live for Christ. The problem with the human heart, though, is that whether we're a Christian or not, we still live in this world. We still live in the flesh. And so we always need to be in constant evaluation of our heart. The best way to do that is to be in God's Word. And the best way to do it is to be in community. Imagine if they made a car with no, uh, with no mirrors. Should I? Yesterday, Chris, Crystal backed out of the driveway hit my car. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. That wasn't bad. She didn't use her mirror, right? If she would have used her mirror, she would have saw that, hey, Brian's car is right here. And I'm not mad, it's a small scratch. I think it adds like uh, character to me. Like, I got a Prius, but it's got scratches on it. I'm kind of cool. Um, Norma probably disagree with that. 
Amen. <laughs> the point of us having mirrors on our car and the point of us having a church so that we can look at each other and say, hey dude, I don't know if you knew this or not, but man, you're really mean to your wife. Or hey dude, I don't know if you knew this or not, but you're really selfish. Hey dude, I don't know if you knew this or not, but you're pretty awesome. I really like the way that you parent your kids. When we get to be around each other, it's a full gospel community. We get to see into each other's lives. But Jeremiah 17, 9 says, our heart is deceitful and wicked. This is why we need each other. This is why we need God's word. But more than we need each other, we need God's word. Guess what we need? The last point on your paper, we need the heart of Christ. We need the heart of Christ. Christ was perfectly thankful. He thanked the Father for His daily bread. He thanked God uh, for His answered prayer in John 11 after He raised Lazarus from the dead. He even thanked God for the cross in Luke 22. He thanked God for the cross. Jesus was perfect. He was perfect in fellowship. He was perfect in that He, the Father, and the Holy Spirit were triune together always. He desired to be with His church. He had perfect fellowship. He sent Himself. He died for us. He longed to be with us in that way. He was perfect in certain. He laid down His life for us. Mark 10, 45 said, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for many. Jesus was uh, perfect in encouragement. He gives us authority. He gives us power. Isaiah 40 um, verse 30 it says, excuse me, verse 29, he gives power to the faith. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Great job, but you know, if you if you guys are weak right now, if you're if you're in a if you're in a temporary or a permanent state of weakness, you're struggling with your sin, there's something that's plaguing you, there's something that's bothering you, you need the heart of Christ. You need to be overcome with strength. Because in and of ourselves, we are weak. Our hearts are deceitful. We can't trust Him. We need the heart of Christ. Christ had the desire for all to be saved. He didn't come for the Jews. He didn't come for uh, higher class people. He didn't come for middle class people. He didn't come for lower class people. He came for all people. Revelation 5 9 says, When we're gathering our prayer of God, there'll be every nation, every tribe, and every tongue, worshiping for all eternity. Whether you're Russian, you're American, you're African, you're whatever, we're all going to be there who trusted in Christ. Christ was never ashamed. They, te they put him on trial. They asked him who he was. He boldly says, I am. The I am. He was not ashamed of who he was, so much so they sent him to the cross. They killed him. He stood, he stood firm on the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He was unashamed. And Colossians 2.9 says that in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Jesus Christ had the heart of faith. He was God. Jesus Christ is God. He had the heart of faith. His faith was the greatest. He never sinned because he could not. He was perfect. His love is perfect. And his heart motivates, or excuse me, his heart motives were always pure. This is the heart that we need. So again, does your heart beat for Christ? Does your heart beat for Christ? This is not a checklist. This is not, this is a pattern, excuse me, this is not a checklist, it's a pattern of those whose hearts beat for Christ. It's not about doing stuff or not doing stuff. It's about living out our identity. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, man, I, I urge you, trust in Him today. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. And the wrath of God abides on those who don't trust in Christ. We deserve it. All, every single person here deserves that to God. But He gave us Christ instead. And He's offering His grace to you today. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. We are, through the power of the Spirit, we are testifying who Jesus is in our lives and the lives of others. You do that. You live for Christ. So you, you have the heart of Christ. Does your heart beat for Christ? 1 Corinthians 10.31 God starts to go into the rhythms, right? The, the title of the sermon was The Rhythm of a Heart That Beats for God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, God gives a prescriptive command. He says, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So guess what the heart 
should be, of a Christian should be to glorify God all the time. Will we fall short? Yes. Do we have a mediator who's perfect? Yes. And as a result, just like Rome 2,000 years ago when there was a suffer of people, guess what's happened in the Charlotte over the past 10 years? Guess the reason, why the reason we planted the church? Because people are coming to our area that need to hear the gospel. They need to see our hearts beating for God, and they need to hear about the saving grace, the finished work of Christ, that they can be forgiven, just like our dinner guest a couple nights ago. They no longer have to try to earn God's favor, because they'll never do it. You never earn God's favor. You gotta be perfect. So He's done that today. Um, if you're not a Christian and you want to learn more about Jesus, or hey, the Holy Spirit saved you here, Hallelujah! We want to welcome you to our family. If you have questions? Please see me. See one of these other guys. We'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. But in the end, it's God's glory that we seek. It's God's glory that we seek. So. As we said in 1 Corinthians, whatever we do, eat, drink, whatever it is, let us do it to the glory of God. Let that be the pattern of our heart. To live lives with God's people on mission as we listen, we bless, we eat, we recreate, we celebrate birthday parties, we come together and eat food, whatever it is, let us do it with gospel intentionality, pointing people to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Father, thank you for your word, which helps us know how to live. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ, that no matter how fall, how, how short we fall of his glory, that you forgive us and you love us. I pray, God, that you empower your people in this church and throughout the world to live on mission for you. And I pray that that gospel that saved Paul and saved Martin Luther and saved me would save someone today, and that you would inspire those in this room who are, are saved to go be on mission for you. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We pray Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.